It is so good to see you this morning. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. Thank you for being here in person. And thank you for joining us. So those of you who are joining us virtually on YouTube and Facebook, whatever platform you're on, thank you for your presence. As we get started today, let me remind you, fill out your little Connect card, put it in the basket as you leave, along with any offering you might bring with you today. And also, while you're doing that, let me share with you a few announcements if I can. This afternoon at 4 o'clock, we will have an administrative council meeting. Those of you who are on, officially on the administrative council have already received a notice about that. But everyone's invited to come. We'll be in the Family Life Center across the street in the big room so we can uh, super socially distance and wear your mask and it should be safe. Uh, we do have some interesting things to talk about. So uh, if you can come, that would be great. Everyone, of course, again, is invited to uh, attend. Uh, I want to remind you, it's not too late to sign up for our Bible studies Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. I'll be glad for you to uh, sign up for those. Both the Bible study as well as the administrative council meeting are on Zoom as well. If you can't come tonight or don't feel comfortable coming to the administrative council meeting tonight, see Mary Parker before you leave and she will send you a Zoom link um, and how you can attend that virtually as, as well. Uh, also, Ash Wednesday is coming up. Uh, we're going to try to do this uh, in several different ways for Ash Wednesday. Uh, you can come by. Uh, the hours are there. An hour in the morning, an hour at lunch, and through our drive through in the parking lot downstairs. And uh, you can have the imposition of the ashes through the drive through if you'd like to do that. Also, uh, starting tomorrow, anytime after tomorrow, if you want to come by, we'll give you a little package. And uh, the package will have the ashes in them and the bulletin. Uh, of uh, uh, order and you can uh, take those and do it virtually. We'll be running the Ash Wednesday service uh, on Ash Wednesday all day. Uh, I'll be on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the computer, on the internet. Or you can come at 6.15 to a, a traditional service. If you come at 6.15 again, please, you need to call make a reservation because we're very, obviously, very limited in our space uh, here. So don't forget Ash Wednesday. And finally, uh, we're excited today that uh, Lane is going to be bringing God's word to us. He's going to be preaching today. I think everybody knows Lane. Lane has been our youth pastor here for several years and done a terrific job. What you may not know is that recently Lane has taken on additional responsibilities as our online pastor. So Lane is coordinating all of our online endeavors, and you're going to see a lot more uh, things, uh, offerings from Sam Jones as we go forward in the next uh, little bit. And by the way, if you watch online, uh, if you watch it live stream, one of our services, and you comment and somebody says to you, good morning, it says Sam Jones Methodist Church, but it's really Lane, that's who's doing that. So, yeah, so that, that's who the, the voice is behind the text as you uh, c uh, communicate uh, if you watch live stream any of our events. Again, thank you so much for being here. God bless you. Let's prepare our hearts to worship, shall we? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, how grateful we are to be in worship this day. Lord, may your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us and empower us. And may our worship be found pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is, Come, Christians, join to sing. Hallelujah. I invite you to stand and sing softly as Ryan leads us in this hymn.
please remain standing for our morning affirmation of faith. It's printed in the bulletin. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we continue with our worship this morning, let's go into a time of prayer. And as we do that, I invite you to spend a moment in silent prayer. As you remember those concerns which are on your heart this day, I know there are people you want to pray for. I know there are things you want to thank God for. So we'll give you a, a moment to do that, and then I'll lead us in a brief morning prayer. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you and we call upon your name this day. We glory in you, our God, and our strength, for you have told us to seek your presence continually, and we do that now. You have told us to remember the wondrous works you have done, and we do that now, for you are our God, and there is none like you. You never promise what you will not keep. You never fail, regardless of how small and insignificant we might seem. You have a people purchased by the blood of your son, and you will bring us all into glory. But Lord, we've sinned, and we've failed, and we've not been who we should be in Christ. We've loved the world and ignored your word. We have forgotten you by thinking so much of ourselves. Lord, please forgive us. We give you thanks and ask that you bless and guide and direct our leaders this day. Be with our new president and new vice president, our national, state, and local leaders. Grant them courage and wisdom and faith, all that they need to do their job. May they get beyond partisanship and ego and do what is right and good and holy. And Lord, we pray that you bless Sam Jones Church. Lord, use Lane this day to herald Jesus for us. Cause your gospel to advance all through our community, we pray. Oh, Lord God, now prepare our hearts to receive your word. May it change us. For what good is hearing unless it does that? Wash us, shape us, refine us, shatter our misconceptions about you, and reconstruct our values. Lord, make us different today. Make us less and you more, for that would be best for all. And do this, Lord God, for Jesus' sake. We ask all this. In the name of the one who was and is and always will be, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught those who would be his to say together in prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
stood up real fast so I can pretend like y'all are clapping for me. <laughs> Take this off. So, um, good morning. I'm Lane. Uh, it's, it's a fun uh, tidbit around here about how I like to prepare the night before for things. So when somebody asks, well, what's your sermon going to be on? I'm like, well, that's Saturday night's problem. But around here, everyone else is well prepared so they like to do the bulletin on like thursday before sunday i don't know why we don't do them just on sunday morning that's a joke guys i know why but so i was i was told that if i didn't come up with my sermon stuff that i would have to help with the bulletins so i was like oh i better get on this so i just yelled out well whatever the lectionary says the gospel reading just put that down it's about casting out demons guys um, so this may get weird, but uh, I made this bed, now I'll lie in it. But today's scripture comes out of the first uh, chapter of Mark, verses 21 through 28, and I'll read those now. They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our thanks be to God. 
What have you do- to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. In all honesty, if you, if you are expecting a sermon about exorcism and spiritual warfare this morning, I'm going to go ahead and apologize. That's not what you'll be getting this morning in this church. Um, this confrontation between Jesus and this unclean spirit is dramatic and it captures our attention. But there's something even more important going on here. And it's described by the witnesses in the synagogue. They say, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So as I was studying up for this, um, uh, it's, it's notable to know that this story is from Mark's gospel. And Mark's gospel has this feeling of urgency to it. Things happen quickly. We're witnessing a miracle and we're not even out of the first chapter yet. And it's also helpful to note that biblical scholars uh, agree that Mark's is the oldest of the four gospels. And that fragments of, of Mark's text were, text were used by Matthew and Luke. John is an altogether different story, but we won't go into that today. And the point is, is that Mark is the oldest of our four gospel accounts and that Mark's text was circulating and spreading the good news about Jesus Christ before the other three. Mark's text contains no, no birth narrative, no choirs of angels, no baby in a manger. It begins with an adult Jesus being baptized by his cousin John in the Jordan River. And the reason I'm telling you is because it has to do with authority. Namely, Jesus' authority as the Messiah, the Son of God. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke tell of his special birth of a virgin mother with a father descended from King David in the town of Bethlehem, proclaimed by a star. And this miraculous birth is a fulfillment of words spoken by the the great prophets Isaiah and Micah. The circumstances of Christ's birth then establish his authority as the Messiah before he even takes his first breath of air as a newborn baby. But Mark doesn't include these details. The Gospel of Mark begins with a grown-up Jesus. He's baptized, he calls his disciples, and he enters the synagogue to teach. And that's where we're at today. This is his first recorded teaching. And each of the gospel writers are working to establish Christ's authority to convince people that this Jesus guy was in fact the Lord and the King. And Mark's account of this episode in the synagogue is meant to show those who read and hear the text that yes, Jesus of Nazareth was and is the Christ. And even when the unclean spirit makes his appearance, Mark tells us that that those listening to Jesus in the synagogue were amazed at his teaching. For he taught as one having authority and and not as the teachers of the law, or or some translations call them the scribes. If you don't know a lot about the scribes, that's okay. I I didn't until I studied this. But when they taught, it was usually repeating other texts that they had recorded. So they said, so-and-so said, and -and so-and-so said, and so-and-so said, and so-and-so said, and you've heard it said this, and you've heard it said that. But Jesus didn't do that. Because he came up there with the authority of God. There's something different about the way Jesus teaches. A lot of y'all don't know this, but for a long time in college, I wanted to be a history professor. Okay? I pictured myself wearing a lot of corduroy jackets with leather palms on the sleeves that perhaps I'd take up smoking a pipe or at least walk around with one in my mouth. Um, I I would let my beard just go wild. Uh, And this had a lot to do with Dr. George Terrell. He was the head of the history department where I I first started out at college, and I took every class he taught. Actually, we became really good friends. I even took his four-and-a-half-hour-long class that was on Tuesday nights. One teacher who got up front with no notes and just lectured on, uh, it was American history, for four-and-a-half hours straight. And you didn't come in there with a Captain D's box and open it up and eat your fish and fry. Like, you, you paid attention the whole time because you never knew what was going to be on his test. I loved his class so much that I, I would stay afterwards and I would ask him questions. And he was always so great. And he fascinated me with, with how he taught because he loved history so much. And he loved teaching so much that it just, it was who he was. And to sit in his class, I, would just, I was just fascinated. 
And he was the hardest teacher in the whole school. He taught in a way that captivated me. It made me want to hear more, learn more, stay after class, ask him questions. Now, biology, I apologize. Um, my professor hated his job. I stayed after class because I dozed off in class and no one was kind enough to wake me up. And I feel bad that I don't, I don't remember his name now. Some of us may have had a teacher that like fascinated us and that's not even like barely holds a glimpse to what it must have been like to hear Jesus teach. No one's nodding off while Jesus taught in the synagogue that day. His teaching's so unique, so captivating that they're, that they're amazed. And more than amazed, they begin to see that his authority was unlike any other they had encountered. This Jesus was no regular religious teacher. He was the real deal. And it's in the midst of, of this realization washing over them that the man with the unclean spirit speaks up. And again, some translations call it a demon. Uh, they, there's different things, but the spirit or demon, whatever you want to call it, it, it's a force opposing God that has somehow controlled this man. And this spirit, it's threatened right now. Like, like it's, it's there and it realizes what's fixing to happen, what is currently happening, and, and is looking around at these people that are, that are seeing this authority. It's threatened. It recognizes Jesus as the Christ, and it's afraid. If I did, I'd be afraid too. Because in front of him, teaching is, is the only one who could put an end to the tyranny and, and the control of, of this man's soul. If Mark is the action-packed gospel, this is the first fight scene, guys. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. I read some translation that like, it would be more accurately translated to shut up, which, you know, like I don't allow my daughter to say shut up, but like I really appreciate Jesus getting her like, shut up. You know, like that's, that's, that's scary and that's intimidating to me. It says, be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him, and it did. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. The people in the synagogue that day, they just witnessed a miracle. That Jesus has an authority unlike anything they or we have seen before or will ever see again. They were already seeing the authority in his teaching. And then he doesn't, he doesn't miss a beat. That's what I like. You know, the, the unclean spirit starts yelling out and, and Jesus doesn't like debate or anything. He's like, just stop, cut it out. And they see this, only the Messiah can open our eyes, our hearts and minds and cast out the demons that separate us from God's will. And what are those demons? What are those unclean spirits? They're the forces that take hold of us, that possess us, that undermine our full humanity and make us seem less than the reflections of God's perfect image we are meant to be. These things can be per very persuasive. They trick us into to believing that we are weak or defective or irredeemable. We all struggle with unclean spirits. Not little red horned beings that hop around with tiny pitchforks. I, I don't know if y'all remember cartoons, but I thought back to like how every moral decision came down to a, a little angel on one shoulder and a little devil on the other. But our unclean spirits are the forces that pull us away from the path of Christ. Christ calls us to be peacemakers and unclean spirits sow discord and violence. Christ calls us to love our neighbors and unclean spirits promote suspicion and selfishness. Christ calls us to forgive and unclean spirits thrive on grudges and vengeance. Christ tells us not to worry, that every hair on our heads is counted 
An unclean spirit's whisper that we must work harder and look better and earn more to be worthy of love. I have my unclean spirits. I'm sure you have yours. We don't have to fear. Because our unclean spirits don't stand a chance against the good news of Jesus Christ. Grace and mercy and wholeness are ours for the taking because he gives them to us just as he gives himself for us. Our experiences of restoration or freedom from our personal demons are not always as quick or as dramatic as in today's gospel reading, but they are no less life-changing. There's much good news here for us today. First, that we are not our, our unclean spirits. We are so much more than the ugliest part of ourselves. Jesus sees us and knows us for who we really are. Precious creations of God. Christ looked at that man in the synagogue that day and saw past the ugliness to the essential goodness of a child of God. And in our moments of greatest despair, when we feel utterly alone, when we can see no light at the end of our tunnels of struggle and sadness, we must remember that for us, just as the man in the synagogue, Christ changes everything. Christ's authority is our refuge, our healing, and our strength. There are other great teachers and thinkers and leaders, others who have changed the world. But the authority of the Messiah, the authority on display that day in the synagogue is unlike any other. I struggled with, with what to say to, to wrap this up. I wanted to end with this powerful proclamation of Christ's authority, but there are quite literally no words. And there's a quote I remember, and I apologize that I can't remember who said it, but there were some, some, some thinkers arguing about literary uh, leaders and how they compare to the person of Christ. And one of them said, if Shakespeare were to enter this room, we would all stand up and applaud to honor him. But if Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth were to come in, we should all fall down and kiss the hem of his garment. The nature of Christ's authority, which saved a man's soul on that Sabbath day so long ago, cannot be perfectly defined in words. Nor can it be fully understood in the mind, but it can, without a doubt, be known and felt in the depths of our hearts. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, you come and you offer us freedom and healing and restoration. You come to us with the, with the authority that only you can give. We thank you for that. Amen. If you'll please stand. Uh, the next song is in your, is in your bulletin. Uh, let's stand and sing together.
you'll be, please remain standing to receive the benediction. Jesus comes to us offering healing and hope, speaking and acting with authority. Listen to him. Go into this world confident in God's love and healing power. Go in peace. And will God's love and peace always be with you? Amen.